We are continuing this morning with a series of parables that Jesus tells. More often, there are those who will read this parable and think this is a true story. No, it's a parable that Jesus tells to make a point. He wants to make the point that those who uh, want to, in some way, impress God with their religious performances have something else coming for them. Now, those are Wilma's words, but never mind. He tells the parable using two extremes. And it seems that Jesus always knew how to get to his listeners, especially those who were following him and looking for something to complain about. You know, we got no, they're still in the world around us today. People who are looking for some way to complain about us so that they can have an excuse not to live the life that God has called them to live. But Jesus had a way of getting to his audience. He's going to use two extremes in this parable to make his point. The Pharisees on one hand and the tax collector on the other hand. The Pharisee, a religious leader who um, knows the law and does all that he can to practice the law in its entirety, in some ways so that he may impress God. On the other hand, the tax collector, the one despised by the Jews. If we think the Samaritans were despised by the Jews, the tax collectors are in a different category. For them, they are condemned to a place in hell that nobody is ever going to open the door to. I mean, nah, those are Wilma's words again, but never mind that. The Jews despise tax collectors, and these are Jews. And their only sin, if you will, the crime is that they are tax collectors. They are working for the Romans. So here is Jesus telling a parable using the tax collector, the, the, the Pharisee on one hand and the tax collector on the other hand. Now you know he got the attention of his audience. They're going to listen to right, where he's going with this. The two of them come to the temple to pray. Now there is another problem with this parable. The tax collector knows that the last place you want to go is the temple. They will make sure they will have the ushers at the door waiting for you to show up and so they can show you where to go next. Almost like some churches, you know, if you haven't, never mind that. But anyway. <laughs> the tax collector will come to the temple and both men have come to pray. The Pharisee is standing there making his case to God of how good he's been this week. Lord, I went to church. I didn't miss Bible study. I gave my pledge and I filled up my pledge card. I'm, I'm kidding. Never mind. But I filled up my pledge card and I did all of the things that you know I should do. I gave a tenth of all that I have. Am I not good? Good boy, good boy. The tax collector, on the other hand, would not even lift his eyes. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I am not worthy to come into this place to call upon your name, but have mercy on me, a descendant of Abraham. Jesus really got the attention of his listeners. Now, he puts the tax collector in a better light than the Pharisee. And you know the community have respect for the Pharisee as the religious leaders. And they are not pleased in some way with this parable. But lift that from that context and put it in our context. What might Jesus be saying to you and me this morning and to our world today? I suggest to you, Jesus is reminding us today that we cannot impress God with our outward appearances. I don't care how many times you come to church, how much money you give to the church, how much you contribute to a helping hand and the, all of the, 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 the good work that have been done out there, you still will not be able to impress God. God is not, in my opinion, impressed by those things we do for public consumption. God is impressed with what is going on in there. Why are we doing what we are doing? Why do we come into this place on Sunday morning? Is it to fulfill our weekly quota of going to church? At least, go we went to church this morning. Are you pleased? We didn't even spend time in Walmart. We went to church. <laughs> Should God be pleased because we showed up this morning and others are still in bed? 
So that means we get a dispensation from the cold weather or from the rain or from the snow? No. We will face life trials and tribulations just as others who have never darkened the door of the church or who find all of the excuses why they will not come to church because those of us who come to church are a bunch of hypocrites. Can you hear the Pharisee right now? I'm not like that guy. I'm like the rest of the folks out there. They don't even give flesh to the church. They don't even fast. They don't even do those things that they should be doing. Lord, are you not impressed with us? Episcopalians, oh, I'm crying out loud. And God should be impressed with us because we have done the religious things that the church says we should do. No, God is looking in there. God sees us when no one else is looking, for he reminds us that humanity look at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. He reminds us in his selection of David, even though God knew that David was going to mess up somewhere down the line, he reminds us in David's selection to be king when all of his other brothers came and then they sent for the teenager who was out in the field. God looks at us in a place that no one else can see us. And so while the Pharisee is standing there trying to impress God with all that he's done, God in some way is impressed by that tax collector who recognizes his need for mercy and compassion. Where are you today in your walk with God? Do you recognize your need to cry out to Lord, Lord have mercy on me, a sinner? I've tried, but Lord, I know I cannot impress you. Nothing we do is a surprise to God. I've said that on a number of occasions, and I remind us again. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Before we were formed in the womb, he knew us, and he knows us today, and he will remind us, in my opinion, at the exit of life as we know it. And if that is true, then where can we hide from you, O oh God? Where can we go that you will not see us? The psalmist reminds us, if we were to fly to the utmost part of the world, his presence is there. If we were to make our bed in the world of the dead, his presence is there. So where can we go from your presence, O oh Lord? The answer is nowhere. For he's everywhere. And so as we live our lives, it is not to be consumed by what other people think about us. I mean, we can't help it. But it's not to be consumed by what people are thinking about us, but more so about what God sees. Why do we do the things we do? Are we doing it so that we are witnesses of God's love, mercy, and compassion? Or are we doing it so people can praise us? If we are doing it for people to praise us, we have a problem on our hands. We should be doing it whether people praise us or not, that God knows our motive is right. We are doing it because we recognize how blessed we are by God and that we should be witnesses of God's mercy and compassion. Because we live in a world in which people stand to condemn others just like that Pharisee standing there looking at a tax collector and saying, I am not like him. God, you should strike him right now and kill him because he has not pledged, he has not fasted, he has not done all the religious things the church says or the synagogue says he should do. There are people in our world today who are prepared to stand in judgment on others because they have not done all the religious things we say they should do. And God should be impressed with them and not with others. That's the reason why we just don't understand why the world is the way it is. Because God is not going to do that, at least in my opinion. God is not going to get busy striking down everyone who have not fasted, everyone who have not given pledge to the church, everyone who has not gone to church today. He's not going to run around the community striking down everyone. No. And he's not going to grant you and me 
dispensation or special blessing because we came to church this morning. God is looking in here because there will be that one who didn't go to church but it is already at work and his or her heart is right there communing with God while he or she is at work. Now I don't say that because I don't want more people to come to church. I want, them, I want all the pews to be filled. Yeah. But does that mean this is the only place that God can be found? No. I want people to come to church, but I don't want people to come to church just because they're going to occupy the pews. I want people to come to church because they want to come and be a part of a community that seeks to worship God, to give glory and honor to God for who God is. The Pharisee wanted to, in some way, through this parable that Jesus tells, wants to let the community know that I have fulfilled the religious requirements for being a good Jew this week. And our tax collector should be condemned because he's a tax collector. There's no way in this parable that it says that besides being a tax collector, this man was a bad person. Jesus does not suggest that. He just said he's a tax collector, and just by saying he's a tax collector, the community already has condemned him. Just like we do in our world today. Condemning people for one reason or another. Those who humble themselves will be exalted by God. And those who exalt themselves will be humbled by God. May God be the one to lift us up so that the world may see us as witnesses for Christ. May we go forth from this place to live our lives not for public consumption, but because we know the God who sees us when no one else does. May we live each and every day to his honor and glory. And so that when all is said and done, he may then look us in the eyes and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. May we live because God sees us for who we are. And may we live to his honor and glory. Amen. Amen.